Amen, church. Amen, amen. Good morning. It's great to be here today. Uh, if you're newer here, we had like four new families in the first service, so I imagine there, there are some in this service. My name is Seth, and I want to, uh, I want to add to uh, Francois' welcome and welcome you. I'm so glad you're here today, regular attenders. I'm glad you're here, and we're going to do what we do every single week. So grab your Bibles, if you would. You're like, I don't have a Bible. We'll grab your devices. If you, if you don't have a device, we've got you covered. You cannot slink out of this, okay? We've got a Bible in front, in the seat in front of you. If you don't even have a device or a Bible here, we've got one for you. You can use that. Turn to John chapter 12. Uh, we are continuing a series uh, in a message today called Processing the Cross. Processing the Cross, and while you're turning there, I'm a big military history buff, and I know you know that because half my illustrations are like war illustrations. I love military history. I read it all the time, and there's a reason for that. It started when I was a senior in high school. Uh, I had a friend of mine. One day, she was like, hey, I want to I wanna take you to introduce, I want to introduce you to my grandfather. And I always, I always dug uh, war stories before that, but I, it never really captured me until this moment and um, it never, the, 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 the fact of, you know, we celebrate in Memorial Day this, this week, this weekend we're celebrating um, the lives of those who have been sacrificed for our freedom, and uh, we are so thankful for that, and that's such a reminder of the cross in which we are going to be processing together today, but um, I was never really captivated by that until I met this man he was about 85 to 90 years old at that point in time, somewhere around there. He was older. He was an older gentleman, obviously. He fought in World War II. And uh, this man, how somehow the, the conversation uh, took place that he was a World War II veteran, and he began to process his experience right in front of me face to face. Now, we can read about uh, war experiences first, second, third hand, but man, when we sit face to face in front of somebody who is processing their experience, they're live right in front of your face. There's nothing like that. And this, this man had fought in three campaigns. He fought in the Philippine campaign, and then he went to Iwo Jima. He fought on Iwo Jima, and then he went to Okinawa. And he witnessed atrocities. He, he himself, three, four separate occasions, he was telling us this. He's processing this. He's, he's opening. He's unpacking his life before us. He was in hand-to-hand -hand combat on, a multi on multiple occasions. He ended up in Okinawa. He witnessed the mass suicide of Japanese civilians because they believed the propaganda that you never want to fall into American hands. And so they would kill themselves by jumping off cliffs or they would kill themselves through with grenades or, or whatnot. And he witnessed all of that. And I was captured. I was astonished. My one-on-one -on -one experience with him of processing the war in front of me deepened my appreciation for veterans, deepened my appreciation for those who have given their lives so that we might have freedom. I, in fact, I, I kind of scared, there's not many World War II veterans around today. Whenever I see them, I just go hug them. At first, they think this big 265-pound guy is going to tackle them, but I'm not. I just want to say thank you for what you've done in the service that you have given us so that we might have freedom. And I was thinking about that this week, it being Memorial Day, and then us being in John chapter 12. That's kind of what's going on in John chapter 12. We see multiple perspectives, okay? If you start with me all the way at the beginning of John chapter 12, we see the perspective and the processing of Mary in her extravagant worship. And then after that, we see the crowds in, in the triumphal entry and their perspective of him. And even though they didn't have an fully informed worship, man, they were over the top in their worship of him. And we see them process who this Messiah is. And then last week, we see the Greeks. Now, they were curious. They, just wanted, they didn't just want to see somebody do tricks. They were really curious about who, who is this Jesus? Who is this Messiah? And now here in John chapter 12, verses 27 through 36, we actually, this is incredible and overwhelming at the same time. We actually, this morning, get to see Jesus process his impending death. We get to see Jesus. We get to lean in and listen to Jesus as he gives his perspective 
of the cross. He is on display this morning. He is verbally processing the impending. It's like, how can you not hear these words, right? We're going to read them in just a second. But how can you not hear these words and not have a deepening affection and not have a deepening appreciation for who he is and what he did? How could you not love him? I mean, he knew what was coming. I mean, like omniscience and humanity collided. He knew what was coming before the foundations of the world. He knew every second, every step. And yet he still went through with it. He still did it. It's like, it's like hearing somebody's last words. I don't know if you've ever heard somebody's last words, but it's like hearing somebody maybe process a sacrifice. That's why I like movies like Saving Private Ryan and We Were Soldiers. It's like, man, if I run out there, I'm going to die, but, but I think I better run out there. I think if I could run out there, I could save some buddies of mine. And they process it, and you see, you see it in their brain, and it's working, and they say... I'm going to do this, and you're like, my goodness, I cannot believe what they're going to do, and they go and do it. And this morning, we literally get to see Jesus. Of course, he's speaking to those around him, but he's, he's literally having a conversation. He's reasoning with himself, and we get to listen in. Verses 27 through 36, I want to read it for you. Follow along with me, and then we're going to unpack it in our remaining time together this morning. John chapter 12, verse 27, Jesus says, Now is my soul troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, 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 no. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice from heaven came and said, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel spoke to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world, and now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, he's talking about his crucifixion, I will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you then say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, Believe in the light that you may become sons of the light. Now, this is the word of God. We're always wanting to know, okay, what's, what's the intent here? What is the author trying to communicate with us? What is, what is this passage saying in a nutshell? We call it the big idea. If you're liking to write stuff down, you want to write this down. Listen, this is what's happening today. Listening to Jesus process the cross deepens my response to the cross. That's what's going on in the text today. Listening to Jesus process the cross. So, so let, me, let, me, let me say it like this. What do we lose? One of the things when we study the Bible, we ask ourselves as we look at a passage, we're like, what do we lose if this, this passage is not in the Bible? What, what, what have we lost? I'll tell you what we've lost. What we've lost is the understanding of Jesus Christ and his death prior to his death. So listening to Jesus should have an impact on how I relate to Jesus. That's what I'm talking about. Listening to him process his own impending death ought to change everything about me, ought to deepen my response and my affection and my appreciation to the cross. So the question we want to answer is how? How do I more deeply respond to the cross? And John, by way of the Holy Spirit, gives us, through Jesus' reasoning, gives us four deepening responses. You got me? Have I been clear? We're going to go through those four responses this morning. Here's the first one. When I listen to Jesus' process, number one, I treasure his troubled soul. That is overwhelming to me. Jesus 
is entirely God, yet he was entirely human. And he allows us to look in on his unbridled humanity. Now, I want you to taste that. I want you to see that this morning. I want you to feel that deeply this morning so that your response is changing. He says in verse 27, my soul is troubled. D.A. Carson in his commentary says that word trouble. That word trouble is a loaded word. It is a heavy word. It means horror. It means revulsion. It means aggravation and anxiety and frustration and anger to the deepest parts of your system. In other words, his guts were churning, literally. And the reason why they're churning is because, remember what he said last week in verse 24? Just look up there real quick. Verse 24. Unless a grain of wheat falls from the earth and dies, it remains alone. And that punches him right in the gut. He knows what that's mean. It's, it's coming. This is, this is John's Garden of Gethsemane moment for Jesus, okay? He doesn't, you, you all know the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew 26, right? Mark chapter, I can't remember, but it's there, okay? Luke something, but it's there. And the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's like three times, take this cup from me, take this cup from me, but each time, not by not my will, but your will be done. John doesn't mention that, but he mentions this. He gives us a hint into what Jesus was experiencing. You think about it with me. He's been speaking a lot about death, hasn't he? I mean, all the way up through John chapter 11, he's speaking about Lazarus' death, and then he raises Lazarus from the dead, and now he's speaking about his death, and as the words are flowing out of his mouth, and the thoughts are beginning to dive deep into his soul and beginning to twist and tear literally at his system, he's troubled. You're like, what's going on? Lots of people die. I've seen, the, I've seen like, you know, I've seen Gladiator, you know, Russell Crowe. I mean, he just took it like a man. You know, the, the, uh, one, of the, one of the great quarterbacks, and uh, people wouldn't agree with me here, a quarterback in the NFL, his name, is, his name is Kirk Cousins. I don't know what you think about the vaccination. I'm not, you know, I, I'm not trying to get into all that, okay? But he wouldn't get it, and, and the media was on his case about it. You know what he said? If I die, I die. If I die, I die. Now, we look at John chapter 12, and we look at the, if he is the greatest influential person in the history of the universe, Jesus Christ, why is he so troubled? Lots of people face death. I'll tell you why he's so troubled. Because just a few days later, he gets on that cross, and what does he say? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'll tell you why he's troubled. Jesus, while he understands that it, it's, it's his life that will give salvation to many, and it was a joy. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says, with joy he endured the cross. The cross wasn't enjoyable, but the accomplishment that the cross brought was joy to him. What did the cross, the cross bring? Salvation for many. And while he understands that, he also realizes that his death is means curse and pain and sin for him. And that is agony. That is straight up gut churning to his soul. Human nature of Jesus. Functioning in unbridled humanity. I think sometimes we get hung up like our Christology doesn't allow sometimes for the depth of, depth of his humanity be, to, to be before us. We have trouble thinking that, but this is what Jesus shows us. He's letting us in, and that is a good thing for us. You realize that, friends? Church, that is such a good thing for us. Hebrews 4.14, we have a sympathetic high priest who is tempted in every single way, yet without sin. He knows what we're experiencing. He has felt what we're going through. He can relate with your struggle, with your gut-churning trouble right now. Several years ago, I, a lot of you know I have a back of an 80-year-old. <laughs> I really do. If I make sudden movements, I'm out for like a week. And, uh, I mean, it's just a joke. It's true, but it's funny. You can laugh with me. Um, and a few years ago, I had to have surgery. But before that, I had some cortisone shots. I remember the first time I went to get a cortisone shot. I don't know 
what they do for you, but they had me jump up on this table, lean forward, and the guy took a needle like that, and he pressed it into my back, and he, into the place that was not working right, and I'm like, this is not going to be fun, and the guy was so rude. He had such a horrible bedside manner. He's like, get up on the table. Man, you're a big guy. The bigger they are, the harder they fall, and I'm like, what, is, <laughs> what are you doing, <laughs> and he pokes me, and he hit my nerve. And while he hits my nerve, I jump like I've been electrocuted, and I'm flopping like a fish on the floor. And he's like, told you, bigger they are, the harder they fall. I don't usually do that. I never do that. Sorry about that. It was not a good experience. He was not empathizing with me. He was not a sympathetic high priest at that point in time. A few months later, I went back, and it was, luckily it was another technician, and I had a bunch of questions. And the guy was so gentle and nice, and, and he just, he was, he was so patient, right? And, and he did the thing that he was supposed to do, and I didn't flop like a fish and all of that. And, and at the end, I'm like, man, I could tell you knew what you were doing, and thank you so much, man. The first experience I had, it was a doozy. And he said, listen, I've had back pain, I've had back surgery, and before I had back surgery, that was the way I was. But now that I've been up on the table, I promised myself I'm never going to treat a patient like I used to treat them because I've been through it, and I've been up on the table. Listen, the only religion in the world that says the creator of the universe has been up on the table is Christianity. Jesus knows. You know how good that is for us? You know how good that is for us to read in John chapter 12, verse 27? Now my soul is troubled. You know how good it is for us to see, though ultimately 100% God, he was 100% human, and he struggled, and his gut churned because I have a sympathetic high priest. Who knows? He's been on the table, and in some way he knows more that I know and you know about what we're going through. He took on flesh. He became a man. He lived in the middle of the hard realities of life. He lived in the middle of the fallen world. He faced all the temptations we face, yet he did not sin. He endured every single one of them. We give up after five minutes. He never gave up. So that when I go to him for help, I can know that he can help me. I can know that he understands in the hardest situations or the most trying of my relationships, I never stand alone. I never stand alone. I can be assured of that, not only that I'll receive his sympathy, but that that mercy that he gives me in that moment is appropriate for my moment of need. That's a good spot for an amen, church. Isn't that good news? Shouldn't we treasure that? How sweet that is, huh? Treasure it. Trust him. He's the sympathetic king. This is what we get when we listen in on Jesus. We're listening in. Our response is changing. Secondly, when I listen to Jesus' process, not only do I treasure his troubled soul, but I savor his sovereign purposes. He has a purpose, and that purpose was purpose before the beginning of time, before the ages began. The cross wasn't plan B. The cross was plan A. We see it here, what shall I say then, Jesus says. A lot of scholars debate what he's doing here. Is he actually praying? Is this a hypothetical? Is it rhetorical? Father, save me from this hour. It's almost like he's reasoning himself. He's feeling that. We know that he's feeling that because he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and he literally asks God to remove the cup if it be his will. But it's like he's reasoning. Father, shh. Save me from this hour, but then what does he say? No, 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 no. It was, it was for this purpose. What, what, pur what purpose? Death. What purpose? Glorification through death. That was his hour. He even says it, verse 28, Father, glorify your name. Father, glorify your name through my death. <laughs> glorify your name. What's awesome is a voice came from heaven. The Father is like right on it, right? And he's confirming in front of all of these people, and he says from heaven, I have glorified it. I will glorify it again. 
Now, I love verse 29 because people are like, what was that? What is that, thunder? I mean, you see it in verse 29, right? And he's like, how do you tell a voice? How does a voice thunder? Like, how does that happen, right? But we, they, they never had ampli amplification like we have amplification, right? Some said it was thunder. Some said it was the voice of an angel. They're kind of confused. They don't live with amplification as a culture. They had, they, they had ways to make sound travel, but they didn't have any amplification. They didn't have any microphone. Like, we can go to a concert, and we can have, like, 200,000 of us in, in a park, and I can be in the back row and hear just as much of the concert today as you can in the front row. They didn't have any of that. So when they hear something from the sky and it's not a bird, what do you think their brain's going to think it is? Thunder. Or, at the very most, there must be an angel trying to process what they've never experienced. It's interesting. Jesus says, this voice, this voice was not for my sake. It was for your sake. It was the Father's purpose statement to remind us that this was the purpose from the beginning of the ages. I love that. Man, do I love that. I love that Jesus' death wasn't plan B. I love that Jesus' death was not some breach of some plan. It was the plan. It was the purpose. His whole life, I mean, we see it throughout the Gospels. God, whatever you want. Father, whatever you want, I'm totally surrendered to you, not only to do your will, but when you will it. We see it here in John 12. And he came into the world, Galatians 4, on a divine schedule. Now he'll leave the world on a divine schedule. So it not only was determined that he would die, it was determined when he'd be born, it was determined when he would die, down to the year, down to the month, down to the week, down to the day, down to the hour, down to the moment. Doesn't that just blow your mind? This is the God we serve. And I love that because all throughout the Gospels, everybody's wanting to kill him, right? I mean, everywhere you look, they're wanting to put him to death, and they're trying to kill him, and they're trying to trap him. Jewish leaders planned it. The Romans planned it. Judas planned it. Satan planned it. But everything within the framework of God's will, within the boundaries of God's will, ain't nobody putting down Jesus unless God wills it. And I love, I love the fact, Jamin mentioned this uh, a couple weeks ago, but I love the fact that they're... They're at the Passover. Everybody's got a Passover sacrifice. This is so great. Everybody's got a Passover sacrifice, which is really a picture of that final sacrifice that would come in just a few days in the Lamb of God, yielding up his life for the divine purpose of paying the penalty of all who would believe on him for eternal life. Do you savor that? Do you savor it? The result of savoring is really trusting. It's resting. It's resting in his plans for my life. I love Romans 8, 28, right? We all love it, especially that first part. All things work together for the... Oh, we got to do that better. I'm looking for some participation today, church. Let's do this. All things work together for the... Good. For the good. We love that part. But we can never, ever, ever, we cannot divorce good with purpose, okay? I'm going to read the rest of that verse. All things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Those are linked. In other words, God does not promise you a good life circumstance. God promises you a good life. Big difference. Big difference. We're talking about a joy that goes above and beyond the difficult circumstances, and you fill in the blank. Maybe for you it's not getting into the grad school you want. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's a job loss. Maybe it's a health issue. Maybe it's uh, you got passed over for a promotion again. All those circumstances can be God working his good in your life. Do you treasure that? Do you savor that? Do you trust in that? Do you rest in that? The fact that Jesus did not suffer for, so I wouldn't have to suffer, but when I do suffer, the whole point of it is that I would become more like him. Uh, you, 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 you think of that circumstance right now. 
and plug it into this, that everything in my life is blessed with holy meaning and purpose. There's no situation in my life right now that is meaningless. There's no circumstance that is without purpose. There's no trial that is useless. There's none. It's God working good for those who have been called according to his purpose. Now, I, I understand. Listen, I'm up here preaching like a maniac right now, and I understand that it's street level. That doesn't always seem to feel the case, right? But I can assure you that I am being prepared and you are being prepared, and at the heart of that preparation is the purpose that I would become progressively more like my king. Everything that he ordains, everything that he ordains for us, guess what? He's present with us. He's present in us. Do you savor that? Are you resting in the fact that God somehow, some way is going to turn that? I love Job, right? Job 23, 10. You have tried me. When he has tried me, I will come forth as gold. Man, that is the thing to rest in. And that's a thing to savor. That's a truth to savor. How do I more deeply respond to the cross? Well, I treasure his troubled soul upon listening to Jesus' process, his impending death. I savor his sovereign purposes. Number three, I see his saving work. I see it. I see it. And, and we see three elements of his saving work here today. In 31 through 33, number one, we see his judgment. Now is the judgment of the world. Do you see that? Like, like what is he saying? Well, in his death, in his death, uh, there's a delineation happening between the redeemed and the unredeemed. I mean, we see it all the time. Paul says in, Paul says in uh, 2 Corinthians 2.16, to some you are the aroma of life, and to some you are the fragrance of death. Jesus says, listen, I didn't come to bring peace. Well, of course, I came to bring peace through the cross, but in bringing peace, I'm sending a sword. Brother against brother, mother against father, friend against friend. There's judgment. The cross, in those who reject the cross, the cross is bringing judgment. We see the Jews who rejected him. We see the leaders who condemned him. We see Judas who betrayed him. We see uh, the soldiers who mocked him. We see Pilate who sentenced him. Every, everyone who crucified him and still crucifies him in this present day is judged by the cross. Is at the cross roads of the cross. That's, that's a saving work, element number one, the judgment of the world. But secondly, the defeat of Satan. Now will the ruler of this world, you know who the ruler of this world is, right? The prince of darkness, he's Satan. The ruler of this world will be cast out. And I love that. He defeats the enemy in his death. That's why Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. It is finished. I love, I did some tracing throughout scripture this week. Uh, I did some, like, Satan comparisons all throughout Scripture. And that dude, he is constantly in a pattern of being thrown out. He got thrown out of heaven. He got thrown out of the garden. He, he got thrown out of, of, of eventually the earth into eternal hell. He had Genesis chapter 3, uh, Isaiah chapter 14, Ezekiel chapter 28, Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 20. That, that Satan is getting thrown out everywhere he goes. That is decisive, isn't it? That is strong. Satan's power decisively shattered at the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, it was finished. You're like, well, he's still around. Look at the world. Yeah, I, I get that. He is still around, but he's operating from death row. He's awaiting his execution. The cross is triumph over the enemy. You don't have to let the enemy, if you have Jesus Christ, the power and the penalty of sin you got the penalty of sin that's no more. you got the power of sin that's manageable because you have the power of the Spirit. Third element of his saving work, we see it right here in verse 32 and 33, the drawing of his 
elect, the ingathering of his sheep. When I am lifted up, that's his crucifixion. That's not his ascension, okay? That's his crucifixion. When I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. Now, all people, don't you love that? Anyone, whoever. Now, this is not all people without exception. This is all people without distinction. There's a big difference. This is not all people without exception. This is all people without distinction. Every tribe, every nation, every tongue, God's people drawn like a magnet. That word draw is such a great word. John uses it over and over again. This is the idea of uh, this is like there's no failing when he draws. Okay? His drawing never, never fails. In other words, his death not only makes it possible to offer salvation freely to everyone, John 3, 16, whoever believes in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting eternal life. But his death also secures with certainty, with certainty, the bringing in of all of his sheep. Every single one of them. It's not an attempt to draw which fails. It's the successful bringing in to Christ. And if that is true, why would I lean on my own ability? Why would I lean on my own provision? Why, why wouldn't I lean entirely on his gracious accomplishment in Jesus Christ? I, do you know who Edward Moat is? Anybody in here? I figured not. I didn't know who he was till this week. He wrote a really famous song, though, in 1834, published by William Bradbury in, I think, uh, like 1864. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. You hear that? Isn't that awesome? My hope, you can sing it. You can probably sing it with me right now. I'm not going to try. I tried in the first service. That went, went horribly. It was just not good. Okay? So my hope is, I wish I had, Jamin, Jam I wish you, just, wish you could just sing it right now, but for the sake of time. <laughs> Why don't you say it with me? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood in righteousness. Now listen, listen. There's a verse somewhere in the middle of that song that says this. When darkness seems to hide his face. Hide whose face? Hide Christ's face. That's what darkness does. Isn't that what doubt is? I don't feel him. Is he here? That's darkness trying to hide his face. But what does the next line say? I trust I trust in his, say it with me, unchanging grace. How can I know I can trust God? Well, it's not my intellect. It's not my talent. It's not my abilities. It's not my spouse. It's not my family. It's not my parents. How can I know I trust him? I'll tell you how you can know you trust him. He went to the cross. He gave up his life. His death is the thing that gives you the foundation. Listen, let me say it in another way. This is the gospel. There is, there is one person who is completely faithful to God, yet God hid his face from him. God gave him what us doubters, us sinners deserve so that we can know in spite of all we do, God will never hide his face from us. On that cross, God said, Jesus says, you know, Jesus says, uh, what does he say? I can't remember. I just said it. Help me out. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He did that so we didn't have to doubt. And so we can know beyond assurance that God will never hide his face from those who believe in Jesus as their ultimate substitution and atonement, as their ultimate structure and standing for their relationship with the God of the universe. In other words, he's the anchor we tie off to, isn't he? We're having a, we're having a series this summer. I, I seriously can't remember the name of the series. We, we, we said it a long time ago, but it's got something to do with anchors and tying off to them in every season. And uh, Christ is our anchor. He is our rock to be found. And did you know that you were hardwired, every single one of us? Every single one of us were hardwired to find what you are seeking in him alone. So stop seeking elsewhere. Run to the anchor, run to the rock who is Christ. What, what difficult circumstance, Christian, what 
difficult circumstance, relationship, job, health, etc., are you facing right now in this moment? And how does the power of Christ provide for that difficult circumstance right now, this moment? This is, we're getting this from listening to Jesus process his death. And upon processing his death, our response is changing. It's deepening. I'm going to give you one last one. When I listen to Jesus process, I answer his absolute demand. You know, belief's not an option. It's not an option. It's actually an imperative. It's a command. Believe. Walk in the light. Verse 35. Believe. Verse 36. Let's start up at verse 34. The crowd answered him. Yeah, we've heard, we've heard from the law that Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? They understood that Jesus was talking about death. Who is this son of man? Who in the world, in other words, who in the world do you think you are? See the sarcasm? Our son of man, Daniel chapter 7, is coming to uh, establish his eternal kingdom. What's all this death stuff? How can you say lift it up? You're not the son of man. He, he, came, he came for an everlasting dominion. What's all this sin talk? What's all this repentance, judgment talk? We don't, we don't need this kind of salvation. We need actually, we don't need the salvation of the soul and from sin. We need political assistance. That's what we need. I love how Jesus responds to him. It's almost cryptic, right? Jesus said to them, the light is among you. Let, let that hit you. The light is among you. You're looking at him. It's going to be gone in a while. Just a few days. You won't have me anymore. The God himself is staring at you in the face. He's, he's looking at you right now and pleading with you to believe. And The light is among you. The Son of God is among you. The Messiah is among you. Here are the imperatives. Verse 35. Walk. It's not an option. It's a command. It's a demand. Walk while you have the light. Verse 36, while you have the light, believe in the light that you might become sons of light. That's his final appeal. It reminds me of Hebrews 3.15. Today, if you hear his voice, listen, this is, this is for us. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. It's urgency. If you want to write anything in your Bible, write there. Write urgency, the urgency of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Well, some, some of you might say, well, that's too bad for them. They missed it, right? But we have a patient God, and we have plenty of time. We can come to him whenever we want. I want to tell you, too, friend, the, the day of grace is passing. It passed for the world of Noah's time. It passed for Israel. It passed for the Romans. It could pass for you. Do not harden your hearts. Instead, instead, answer it. Answer it. Answer his demand. Answer his absolute demand to believe. That's spirit-empowered life, by the way. You can't answer it apart from the Holy Spirit. The Spirit has to infuse light. I, I used to go to Sunday school. My dad was a preacher. And, uh, you know, Sunday school teachers has a, have a way of scaring the little kids, right? I mean, big time. And my Sunday school teacher would always ask me, she would say, are you a wheat or a tear? I'm like, I'm not a plant. But it was kind of scary because tear, I didn't even know what tear was, but it didn't sound good. It's like, I'm a wheat? I'm a wheat? Are you a wheat or a tear? A tear is a weed, right? It's a, it's, it's a something that is sucking the life out of the wheat. Are you a wheat or are you a tear? Are you a child of the kingdom or are you a child of the enemy? Listen, this is a time of patience, right? This is a time of patience. This is a time of grace. But judgment is inevitable and eternal. And, and God's word begs you, pleads for you, demands that you check and that you listen up. Christians, if you've answered it, show it. Don't you love that little statement at the end of verse 36? What does it say? Sons of light. That's a great little statement. You know what that means? Little lights. Little lights. We're all little lights. This is spirit-infused obedience. Are you the light? 
When you come to Christ, the Bible says in faith and repentance, when you come to Christ, his light floods your life. Matthew 5.13 says you are the light of the world. Philippians 2, I love Philippians 2.15. It says, hey, listen, you're blameless and innocent. You're children of God without blemish in the crooked and deceitful world among whom you shine as lights. Ephesians 5 says that you are, you are in the darkness, but now you are light. Not, not, not reflecting the light. You're, you're literally light. Walk as children of light. If we're sons of light, we're to coexist in this world to influence this world, not to be influenced by it. Spirit-empowered, shining. Spirit-empowered, obedience. You're like, man, the darkness is really dark. Have you seen it lately? And I would just encourage you to turn on the light. Just turn on the light. Light it up. Get in the middle of the world and shine. You're blameless, you're harmless. You're without rebuke. That's, that's, that's the character that you're going for. But you're in the middle of the world, shining. Not isolating yourself from the world like some little commune where we don't touch anybody who doesn't agree, right? I can't stand it when churches act like that where there's some little holy huddle. We're broken sinners in need of a Savior. Amen, church? Don't forget who you once were. Shine the light. Take Christ to them. I'm listening, and as I'm listening to Jesus, it's deepening my response to the cross. I treasure what he's going through. I savor his purposes. Is this you? I celebrate and see his work. I answer his demand. This is, this is my response to the cross, and listening to him process it moves me deeper in my response and appreciation for who he is and what he's done. Father, we thank you.